Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. This is a podcast about the classical world, primarily classical literature and philosophy, but we, you know, <laughs> spread our wings and fly to another classical topic every now and again. Sometimes we hit art and stuff, still hoping to do an architecture lecture. And yeah, that's what we're about, trying to bring old stuff to you in as painless a way as possible. And today uh, we have an episode from Thomas that actually came at the request of a listener, and it was a good request. And then I gave it to Thomas as that good request. <laughs> Not like some of those so, bad requests. Yeah, exactly, and, then, yeah. and then Thomas said, dang it, that is a good suggestion. <laughs> and so, That's exactly how the conversation went. Yeah, it, pretty much. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Thomas. Okay. Oh, I forgot to introduce, introduce us. Yeah, yeah. Who are we? I'm what, AJ what is, Hannenberg, yeah. and I'm joined by Graham Donaldson Hello. and Thomas Magby. Hello. And two of us work at a classical school in Austin, Texas. One of us used to work at the classical school. Um, Thomas has now is, is now going to math school, so he's doing math, math school stuff. So... That's our first time saying it on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. So that is a thing that is true. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about the book of common prayer today. Yeah. You, your intro talked about this being a podcast about like classical philosophy and stuff. So plus whatever we want to talk about is always feels like the secondary category. So I guess we'd call it a classic in terms of it being older than a hundred years old. Right. Is that how I justify this? We had a whole episode about what is classical. Like a long time ago. Like, it was like episode 13. I think that, that was my first episode is what is classical. I haven't listened to it in uh, like as long years, as since yeah. we've done it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, yes, this topic did uh, start from a listener who passed it along to AJ. And I will say to the comment about um, bad requests, I do anytime someone requests a topic, I, I keep a spreadsheet in our um, I keep a spreadsheet of ru- of running topic requests. So I promise we have that. So do you have them in columns like good requests and bad requests? Yeah, I rate all of them on a one to 10 scale. And then no, it's not true. I do not do that. Okay, so we are talking about the book of common prayer today. So uh, I come to this topic as an Anglican. Anglicans use a book of common prayer. Um, Gentlemen, what is your background with this? You know, I say the word book of common prayer, what comes to mind? I mean, Catholicism, obviously. And then I've, I used to read a lot of the the Valley of Vision prayer mm-hmm. book, which was a Puritan prayer book mm-hmm. in my classroom mm-hmm. uh, as sort of just a, a way to show kids how to pray. Didn't but you, know, you didn't like it. Well, I, I liked it at first. And then I sort of realized that it leaned really hard on the people are nothing and worthless and terrible and God is awesome. But it, but the percentage was off. Like it was like 80% I'm totally worthless. Dude, they're Puritans. 20% <laughs> I was God say, is that's rad. The entire... And I, I, I tried to reach out to the Book of Common Prayer for some alternatives that seemed more in line with talking about God and his greatness rather than just how bad self debasement. Yeah. Um, the wrong word. My relationship with the Book of Common Prayer, I grew up Anglican, so I uh, d- used it every Sunday. Although we use the, um, the Book of Alternative Services. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, which is, is it a derivative of the Book of Common Prayer? I can't remember. They had, there was probably one of those like conferences that happened in the 70s where we're like, we need to make this book more like cool for the hip hi- for the hippies in the Anglican Church. Was it a more modern um, book? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That'd probably be why. Um, but the Book of Common Prayer, I mean, so it's, it's from England. Yes. Um, uh, and was when England became Anglican, when they sort of kind of were Protestant, uh, they realized. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> well, what do you mean, kind of? Well, because it's very different than like what was happening in Germany with the Lutherans. Yes. Um, they realized they needed their own book. Yes. That wasn't Catholic. Yes. But it's like eighty percent the same. As um, oh, yeah. as 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 the old prayer book. Sure. Yes. Um, but my own personal relationship is like if you can get if you can start on like the the, the lines. I can probably do it just from like rote memory because I did it every every Sunday as a kid. Oh, so all the um, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed of what we have done, by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and will humbly, humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, have mercy on us and forgive us. Yes. Okay. So good. So what is this book that we're talking about? It's uh, it comes from the Church of England. Um, so I guess we'll talk briefly about. I want to talk a little bit about kind of why this book existed in the first place, which Graham started getting into. <laughs> what? I mean, because we got, you know. That's want... funny. I said Catholicism and it's Church it's of not, England. Yeah. Yes. That's funny. Well, the reason the... it exists is because we wanted, Henry wanted to divorce his wife. So that's why. It <laughs> Though I will say the Book of Common Prayer doesn't come until the next king, yes. which I think is Edward. Um, I'm, nope. Uh, is that not right? Who's the king after Henry the, the Eighth? The king after Henry the Eighth? Yeah. Well, his daughter becomes queen. No, no, not. So 
Um, James I, probably. Edward, no, Edward the Sixth. Edward the Eighth, Edward the Sixth, and Mary the First is what this oh, yeah, says yeah, in front of me. You're right. So under Edward the Sixth, sorry, I got the number wrong. Uh, that's when he the did. He, he like, apart. but he died pretty quick. He did die pretty quick, okay, and then why. also, so then did a lot of Anglicans when Mary the First came around. Gotcha. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so this book. Well, so Graham, you're very knowledgeable about this because this intersects a lot with your Pla- uh, Plantagenets episodes, correct? I mean, or I just, stopped at the War of the Roses, yes. and which is way before. What well, didn't you have we not? I thought we've talked about the, this topic before. Have we not? Like Thomas Kramer, any of these people before? I must be thinking of a different one of your episodes. Then there are there's um, there's different Kramers anyway. Okay, there's there's Thomas and then there's the other guy. <laughs> yeah, yes, other guy. Kramer. Oh, Cosmo. Shoot. Cosmo, Cosmo Kramer. Cosmo <laughs> Kramer. Yep, that's it. That's my favorite of the Kramers. Um, well, then never mind. I've I thought we were treading retreading ground, so maybe we're not. So um, there. Um, there's this time in the history of England and I'm, you know, obviously I'm going to skip like 1500 years and just get to the, um, topic at hand. And, uh, there's this fellow named Henry the eighth and Henry the eighth, um, is married and has had a daughter, but he wants to have a son and he blames, um, his wife. That's, uh, that's Catherine, isn't it? I think Catherine is the first, uh, yep. wife, Catherine of, I don't know. Yeah. Aragon. Mm-hmm. Aragon. Okay. So Catherine is his first wife. They have some kids together. Uh, well, actually, they have, I think, six kids. Uh, most of them die pretty early. Some of them are sons, but you know, either, they're either stillborn or die very, very, very young. Um, Mary, the the um, Mary the first is the only one who uh, survives of those six children. But Henry the Eighth wants to have a son, and so he is blaming his first wife for uh, him not having a son, and so he wants to. Are you saying it's not her fault? <laughs> it's actually the man's fault. There's your fun <laughs> chromosomal fact for the day. Uh, that you know, whatever problem it was was most likely with henry the eighth because he's the one who has the white chromosome syphilis doesn't help either is that what he had i mean if, if in terms of the sickly children oh yes he did okay probably most likely yeah. um i guess that um he so part of the you know uh so he'll eventually uh, meet um is it Anne Boleyn is the next uh wife of his that um that he'll so he'll um he'll eventually go through um, three queens and none of them will yield a, a male heir, which is unfortunate for him. But just to one of them was named Anne Hathaway. Is that? Uh, isn't? Yeah, I'm gonna get all my. And wasn't names. there like a Jane Seymour? Uh, Jane Dr. Seymour's Queen? after that's Anne Boleyn and then Jane Seymour. Doctor Queen, menacing woman. Um, Did you say menacing woman? <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this at all. <laughs> Um, she was that lady that had an iron, you know, like an iron. I see. Spine. I see. Catherine. I see Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour. Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. Oh, it's not an Anne Hathaway? Who's Anne Hathaway? Uh, she's an actress. I don't understand. Okay, so, um, but the the more pressing hmm. to the topic at hand is that Henry VIII uh, starts out married to Catherine of Aragon and wants to divorce her, but is not able to do this. Do you all know why he's married to Catherine in the first place, other than that they had a marriage ceremony? Spain. Say more. Oh, I'm, pres- I'm assuming it's some kind of alliance oh. with this, with the kingdom of Aragon. Now I'm trying to, um, so yes, Catherine is, um, the, uh, uh she is Spanish daughter to Ferdinand the second and Isabella the first. Um, see, it's things like this that make me think you've already done an episode on this. So again, apologies if I've, no, because this is tutors. We, this we, is ended, way too we, long after. we ended after in Plantagenets. We right. didn't even get to the war of the roses. Are you going to do that at some point? Well, you definitely should. Um, so uh, he had, um, he's, uh, they were married to each other because Catherine had previously been married to his brother oh, and then go. his brother died. And then um, Henry VIII married Catherine. Um, this, uh, I can, I can pull it up, but it's in Leviticus of like. Um, he was 19 and she was like 34 or something like that. I don't think the age difference is that large, but she was older than um, him. And he was, he was 18 at the time. I want to say she was like 20 something. Oh, awesome. But um uh, where is it? The when uh, yeah, when brethren dwell together and one of them dieth without children, the wife of the deceased shall not marry to another, but his brother shall take her and raise up seed for his brother. So that clear command that um, he was to marry Catherine and then have children and then you know go on from there, which at the time seemed fine. He was eighteen, probably didn't know any better. Um, and there was no reason to think that he wouldn't have a male heir. Sure. Right. So that's what, that, the, that's the reason they enter into the marriage in the first place. But then at this point, I don't know the, you know, it's 20 years later, they've gone through, um, six children, none of the males. And 
Henry is uh, concerned as to how, as to what he's going to do. Right. Um, so I, I guess let's stop. Let's just pause there. I normally see this presented as a negative thing. Henry the eighth is a bad guy. He wants to divorce Catherine. And so he's just looking for whatever reason possible to divorce. Is that, does that line up with how you all think about this moment in time? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, that's the easy way to teach it. Right. Yeah, didn't he request a divorce from the Pope and the Pope denied him? Yes. And so, then... So he's trying to go through the proper channels, which would be... Yeah, he tried. Yes. And uh, Popes at you know popes have and had uh, given annulments before to allow uh, him to um, divorce Catherine and then find another wife. And so, the annulments have to have like really specific criteria. Like you yes. find out you're actually blood related. Yes. Or there's other ones. Or you've never... Um, sort of consummated, consummated the, yeah. but I mean, you know, six dead kids, you can't have a hard time proving not proving consummated. that one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I guess they didn't all die, but, um, and lying to the Pope is not, and there's other one. I think if, do. if they become a heretic or if they're excommunicated, I think you can, I can't remember that. If so, that would make more sense for, um, after he marries, um, and Boleyn, uh, she essentially gets, uh, accused of heresy. She gets accused of horrible things. And then that's what allows for the divorce eventually. So gotcha. that, that's a strategy that will, he'll take for, Wife the second, but at this point that hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's there are specific things that they're looking for, and the Pope's answer is the Pope's answer is no. Um, and who's the Pope at this time? Clement the seventh. Okay. Uh, so Cle- and Clement the seventh before becoming Clement the seventh was a Medici. Uh, so another angle to this that I hadn't thought of until starting to do research for this is that you have this, you know, so. Uh, Totally. Henry VIII is the king of England. He is looking for a male heir. There's a specific reason that he's looking for a male heir other than just... So um, women at this time can become queen and can um, succeed the throne. Mm -hmm. But there's a point of reference in his mind that made him wary of wanting to do that. Uh, uh, Do you know what that... Do you remember the... This this is during Plantagenet. Yeah, going Uh, way back to... Oh, what's her name? Um... Was it Stephen and I don't know? There's there's this uh, uh, um, Matilda's the one who they attempted to put in power. Oh, that one. Okay, yeah. No, I mean I just remembered that. Yes, in English history up to this time, the, all of the examples of women taking over the kingdom have been met with like civil war and bloodshed. Yes, and the the most recent time before. So we're talking in the 16th century. We're you know 1500s time, and the the time most recent at least again Mm -hmm. a a time before this where a a woman had been installed as queen uh was in the 12th century um this was after um do you remember this about her husband was the the, where we get the name plantagenet from he was french uh she if i'm getting if i have the right queen is william adeline is he the one no he's not the one we get the name from because I thought you told us there's a story about um, a bunch of people go out on a boat yeah. and then they all yeah, yeah they that, all died they yeah. all died yeah. and then um, she is the sort of next in line but then there's somebody on there's someone else that could also be king and then there's this big old basically a civil war yeah. that happens yeah and it's not great just to, just to say it again the the king at the time is out on a boat with a bunch of people this boat um, it's clearly a party boat yes. it was the, was it the king or no it was all the king's kids well, uh, plus other on. people because there's like a butcher on board and he's yeah, the yeah. only person who survives. Um, so they're out on party boat. The party boat flips over, kills all the like heirs to the throne. Yes. Uh, which leaves, um, it's very sad. The prince dies trying to rescue his sister. Yes. The heir to the throne dies rescuing his sister. and They both drown. which then leaves the question of who will take over the throne at this point. Uh, the throne, uh, is, uh, attempted to be passed to, uh, Matilda, um, Empress Matilda is, you know, just pulling it up here. Um, and there is such, uh, strong response, strong revolt to this, uh, to her being placed as uh, head over England that it kicks off a 30 year period called the anarchy. Like that's the, you know, it's, it's like law and order is like vanishes from the land for 30 years. And there's um, this questions of who should be in charge. And so it's thrown the entire kingdom into this state of bloodshed and, um, and terror. Right. So that's what is in Henry the eighth's mind as he's, I'm just trying to present this from this a is a angle. defense of uh, I mean <laughs> defense of, yeah, of uh, the Church of England of the Church of England sure I mean that's a thing that I think has to be in his mind the other side of it is that you get these weird um, uh, Graham is very apologetic for drinking so close to the microphone trying right now trying to Thanks. gulp right in the microphone yeah, how dare you um, and the other side of it is that uh, Henry VIII an English king 
uh, married to a Spanish queen, is requesting from an Italian pope the ability to annul his marriage to maintain um, English um, sovereignty, sovereignty, and and like the line of kings. Mm-hmm. And so you get this strange element, and not only any Italian, but the Medici's, who are a, a prominent family in Italy. It's who uh, did I just say this that. Um, uh, Clement the seventh was a Medici before mm-hmm. he was Pope. So um, there's this other side of it too, where there's like this kind of natural antagonism between the different countries that plays into Clement's decision to say no to the annulment, though he had granted annulments before. Um, am I being clear on mm-hmm. that? So th- there, there are all these things playing into it that makes it more complicated than just Henry the eighth bad guy wants to abandon this poor woman. Um, there are other things that he has in mind, such as the like continuation of the nation of England. Right. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so this will then lead to him asking some smart people to figure out, um, how he can divorce, uh, his wife and like make a justification for it. Um, and there are a few people that go into that decision. The person who we're like focused on for right now is Thomas Kramer is one of those people. Now, meanwhile, we like percolating in the background has been, um, what eventually becomes the Protestant Reformation, yes. uh, starting in what is now the Czech Republic with Jan Hus, and, um, uh, and then you have uh, John Wycliffe in England, and Kramer himself. Uh, Kramer? 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 Kramer. 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 Um, Kramer. Kramer is, Cranberry, yeah. is uh, sympathetic to Wycliffe. Um, and so you've got this whole kind of like Reformation uh, sort of bubbling, gurgle, bubbling yeah. under the surface and yes. you've got Luther going on and then you have the church uh, the, the church reacting kind of you know strongly and violently in some places and then like actually taking on the um, taking on the, 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 the reforming attitudes. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is sort of like, like a, it's almost like a theological movement is going on in the background. Is Cranmer the guy that they, they got for, <clears throat> they, I think he was, his, was he a Protestant, Protestant um, eventually? Yes. Mm-hmm. So he was the guy that they made recant his Protestantism, yes. we'll I think. Yeah. And then, okay. We'll, I, def- we'll definitely get there. That's so cool. It's such yeah. a cool story. All right. Just um, trying, to, trying to place in my head who this guy is. Yes. And, and then um, you've also got Sir um, Thomas More at this yes. period of two, who is just delightful. Um, so it's a really interesting part of your history. And just for listeners, if you like this period of history, there is a wonderful literature series called Wolf Hall, where the main character is Thomas Cranmer. Thomas? I always get, the, I always get the, the two confused. There's Thomas and there's the other guy that like has a theocracy like 100 years later. Uh, anyway, whatever. Um, Thomas Cranmer is the one we're talking about yeah, right now. Yeah, Thomas that, Cranmer. Okay. Uh, and so if there's Wolf Hall, which is very good. I've never read it. Uh, um Uh, My father really loves them and always talks about them. So go for it. And also this episode. No. Okay. So, um, so Henry VIII is looking for justifications for, uh, you know, allowing this divorce to happen to allow the peaceful transfer of power to a king. That's what he's hoping for. Um, So, uh, like I said, enlist these smart people to help him figure out how he can make these justifications. One of them is Thomas Kramer. Thomas Kramer is the um, Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, so he's uh, high up in uh, the religious structure in England and um, is able to make that justification. Uh, you know, there, there's more detail that goes into it, but uh, supports Henry VIII in coming up with this justification for why the marriage should be annulled, why it should be ended. Um, these aren't specific. There are different, you know, ways the story is talked about. Henry VIII apparently was very stubbornly focused on certain verses that you know, so I read one before that said that a brother is supposed to marry the wife of a brother who dies. Well, there are also um, verses that talk about how um, if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an impurity. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless, which seemed to um, match with the situation they were going through. Um, another command in Leviticus, thou shalt not uncover the, the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Um, so there, you know, it's as with all things, it's a complicated topic and they were able to make this argument, you know, somewhat motivated. They had the conclusion in mind when they went to the Bible, they weren't like, you know, I think it's fair to say it was not like a, 
genuine looking for what does Bible the Bible say about annulment, right? Yeah, there was no honest seeking there. Correct. <clears throat> oh, just because we're going to get a bunch of emails. Uh, what have I messed um, up? Yeah. No, it's, it's the person I was getting confused with was Cromwell. So oh. Oliver Cromwell oh, oh, is the yeah. uh, general who leads basically like a theocracy in England for a spell. Um, and then there's a Thomas Cromwell mm-hmm. who also is in play around this time of the story. But okay. we're talking about Cram- Kramer. Kramer. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so all those of you that are already fiercely typing your well actually um, uh, I would still I would love all the well actually emails we have very smart listeners that's part of what I don't I don't like doing historical topics because I know there are many listeners that know this stuff better than I do but uh, we're the ones with microphones so apologies yeah, we passed the test we passed the podcast you shell out 200 bucks for a microphone <laughs> yeah. and then you too can start your own podcast <laughs> that's how this works so they you know the long story short is that uh, Thomas Kramer among others are able to come up with this argument that justifies the annulment between Catherine and um, Henry VIII. So that's what happens. They then um, separate and then um, move on to um, Anne Boleyn, and which goes poorly and then repeats going poorly for five more wives. So there's that. Okay, but this, um, by doing this, essentially, Henry VIII has set up that um, this the Church of England structure, which had previously just existed as like a branch of, Catholicism, that's what this like archbishop role was. It was like the head of the Catholic Church in England. Well, th- th- this then created a separation where instead of going to the Pope to look for something, uh, it was Kramer and the um, Church of England, like locally, that was making this decision in disagreement with the Pope. And well, just as an aside, like this has always been a political and religious tug of war with Rome in yes. England because you've always had a sort of going back and forth between. Can the king um, basically install the Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury, which would have very strong, like political, um, you know, boons? Right. Or does the the does the Vicar of Rome do it? Does the Pope do it? And so, if there's periods where the Pope um, um, has can install the Bishop of Canterbury, and everyone's grumpy about that in England, and there's a t- period of time where the King of England can do it, and that makes Rome grumpy because you have this position of power that can be decided on by either the king or the pope, and it goes back and forth. And so um, that's always been in the background. And yes. so now you've got a, you know, another little um, separation between England and Rome, wherein you've now got um, the Archbishop of Canterbury with strong Protestant sympathies. Yes. As the Archbishop, yes, um, and making a decision that the Pope had previously said no to. So that's that's you know, which will also kind of set up the conflict for the next few generations of kings and queen. Ultimately, is what we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, you just reference this, but just to say again, Henry VIII will have this Protestant sympathy at some level to justify his actions, but also out of this kind of um, what does it look like? The Reformation is happening in other places. Does it need to look a certain way in England? And then the Church of England ends up being the answer to that question, right? What does Reformation look like here? You know, surprise, it looks kind of Catholic, right? So um, so uh, that got us through Henry VIII's divorce, and then I'm going to kind of leave off the rest of it of um, he has many more wives eventually, um, um, and then we'll eventually die, and we'll have a new king in a little bit. But uh, this separation between Rome and England creates a problem then of what is, well, first off, what is like distinctive between England and Rome. And for a while, the answer is essentially like everything is the same. So for Henry the eighth reign, um, there's no, there is no book of common prayer. There's no English service that's like developed and codified at least just to say that I'm sure there were, you know, people did their own thing. Um, and, um, so that will last, you know, Henry VIII will die in 1547, and he is succeeded by Edward VI, I think is what I just said. Well, Edward VI um, will turn to Kramer and, Kramer and ask for this new, you know, what should service look like? He want, and it, Part of it is kind of a self-serving, like, he, you know, he wants his name associated with this, right? Like, anyway, I don't want to, like, criticize all these things, because they end up producing good stuff. But um, So this leads then to the creation of this book of... Um, prayer in 1549. So um, a couple years into Edward the sixth uh, reign. Um, and there are many authors associated with the, or the, you know, obviously many people were involved in the creation of this um, book, but um, Thomas Cranmer is like the 
a chief person responsible for it. You can go and you can still buy Cranmer's BCP, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, and well, just so I say it, so 1549 is the first one yeah. and it's kind of put together quickly. Um, it's meant to be a temporary document. It's replaced in 52 and that's like the book of common prayer. I, 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 when you say the Cranmer version, I, I assume people mean the 1552 yeah, yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, you, you, and you can find it online if you want to look for it. Um, so, um, so we now have this like distinctive, uh, form of worship for the church of England. There's this distinctive, um, service, distinctive prayers, distinctive catechism. Um, and I, um, smells and bells. <laughs> I mean, yes, well, that's what's yeah, again, AJ's association with this at the beginning was Catholicism, but um, I guess it comes out of like the breviary, like the Catholic readings, but um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like probably to most Protestants, it probably feels like a Catholic document, but by that we just mean it's like a formal set, well, it's set, not like set a of prayers, strip right? mall Pentecostal service. <laughs> wow. I don't know. I don't think I know. <laughs> no, what I'm just means. saying if you're, if you're putting it on the <laughs> spectrum of Christian expression, like it is yes. closer to Catholicism than, Yes. Yeah. What you're saying is I can go to church right next to a Cinnabon? Yes, yeah, you can. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's <laughs> probably, the preferred form at some of places, yes. probably even in the in Cinnabon. In the Cinnabon, yeah. yeah. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> if you so desire, why not? Okay, so that... Uh, America. <laughs> America. Okay, so that uh, gets us to, again, 1552. That's kind of the, 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 the version of the Book of Common Prayer that Cranmer wanted to put out, I guess is the way to, to say it. And again, you can look it up and... Uh, you know, your spoiler alert is that this is no longer the book that we use for, you know, Anglicans still exist, right? There's still an Episcopalian church and a, There's church. a couple of them. There are quite a few actually is what I was thinking. <laughs> no, a, as couple I of, saying a couple, couple of Anglican churches. That's what I meant. Yeah. That ACNA and Episcopals. Anyway. Mm-hmm. But just to say like, you know, 500 years later, we still have a church of England. We don't still use the 1552 prayer book. Do you want to take any guesses as to why we don't use the 1552 prayer book anymore? Um, th- there's one, I mean, I remember there was, I don't know how controversial you want to get. There's one in the marriage ceremony where like the wife has to pledge like eternal obedience. Hmm. I remember that being a sticking point. So, you, you know, there are like theological positions that are prominent in the 16th century that aren't sure. the same way we talk about those things now mm-hmm. or have changed in some, some way. So that would be a part of it. Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. Theology is kind of a, you know, it's an evolving process. Yes. Like it, this depends on who you ask, but yeah. So there's that part of it. You want to guess another reason? I mean, you got to change it from king to queen every time. There's a, <laughs> it changes. <laughs> You're not wrong. The first person to, uh, uh, we got it. Yeah. We're gonna have to re, we're gonna have to reprint some of these things to take out queen. <laughs> yes. Uh, y- yes. And the first, but the first person to get rid of this book of common prayer will be a queen. So it's almost kind of a moot point at that, in that regard. Was but, it the Protestant Re- reformation? Uh, that's going on at the same time. And, uh, and, uh, ultimately this is the, the reform, this is the English reformation, right? This right. is the reformation happening in, in, in England. This is a, it's a stupid and petty reason. It's the, like the words and the spelling are really like weird cause it's 450 years or 500 years old. So, uh, you know, the spelling is not standardized in the way that it is now. Um, oh, it's like pre Webster. Yeah. That's or what I mean. It's pre standardization of spelling. Yeah. If I just, uh, if I, if I just open the preface of the 1552 book, it's the book B O K E of common prayer. Um, and you know, there was never any spelled A N Y E thing. The Y T H uh, Y N G E, uh, by the wit W Y T T E of man, it just, you know, things like that. Um, so like they're reading the Canterbury Tales. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, it's more understandable. When is the Canterbury? It's 500 years before this, right? Is, no, it's not that old, is it? It is about 300 years before it. Okay. But so, uh, so language is reading through it. I, I haven't spent a lot of time with the 1552 Book of Common Prayer, but um, you can t- you can t- typically tell what's being said, but it's obviously spelled, I would say wrong, but they would say differently, right? So that's part of that. So that's the 1552 book, uh, uh, prayer book. And this will, um, uh, this lasts until, oh, this lasts until Edward the sixth dies. So, um, Edward the sixth passes and Mary the first takes over. How does he die? Uh, great question. Uh, by death. I don't know. He was, he was young. I can't remember. Maybe he was just sick. He's aren't they all kind of sickly? Termites. Yeah. <laughs> Made of wood. Uh, he fell ill, uh, when his sickness was discovered to be terminal, they, um, 
he named Lady Jane Grey to take over, excluding his half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth. And that didn't happen, though, because Mary becomes uh, queen. So Mary I of England succeeds Edward VI. Um, and is this Bloody Mary? This is Bloody Mary. Um, and Bloody Mary, do you know why she's called Bloody how, Mary? Yeah, how did she earn her moniker? She kills all the English. Did she day drink? <laughs> yeah, she loved drinking Bloody Marys, and so that's where she gets the name. She created the drink, actually. Knew it. Did she really? Oh. No. That would, well, Man, I'm so gullible. I feel like you guys know so much about history, and I'm just I'm just a you know wandering I have child grasping just, for leaves uh, off I have Wikipedia trees. pulled up in front of me. Let's just Do you think here. Catholic Brits call her Bloody Mary? Probably not, right? Well, I don't know how... It'd be interesting, Catholic listeners. So, you know, as an Anglican, Mary the First is like, it's a tragedy, right? So there's all this Reformation happening in England. It has some questionable origin. We've covered that already. But there's like a good thing happening here of a distinctly English form of um, of worship. I didn't say this, but another thing that's kind of a downside bummer is that as these books of common prayer are put together, there are, what are they? There's like laws put in place that are like, you must worship from the book of common prayer. I think they're called the act of uniformity. Mm-hmm. So there's like, you know, you can be punished for not using these books. So, you know, I don't want to. That's paint. not great. Exactly. I don't want to paint this as like. But this. I mean, you're saying there's a an authentic version of English worship is come is sort of um, being developed, right? being developed. Yes. But you also have, for example, in the realm uh, staying still under the Catholic umbrella, the yeah. the worship that happens in Ireland versus Spain versus Italy, yes, all under Catholicism, yes, all has their own cultural expressions mm-hmm. as well. Um, I don't know. I'm just saying that like. There's there is something very different for it to be a break from. Yes, you're saying no. What you're saying is that there's the you know Roman Catholic form of worship that's then localized in certain ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean England has always had, and then this is sort of where we get. Um, I mean they've always they they've, they had a parliament mm-hmm. uh, a lot uh, sooner than uh, um, sort of the, the the absolute monarchies of Europe. Mm-hmm. There, there's always been a, a sense in the back of their mind that kings were under a natural law. Like this is the Magna Carta, that mm-hmm. the kings, that there was a law that was higher than the kings that the kings had to conform to. There was something that they had to do. So the British people have always had that kind of sense of um, we can refer to something else than other just than other other than just the human powers of authority. Yes. So. Uh, um, um, so it, it makes sense that um, in the English mind, breaking with Catholicism is less um, – it was not as much as a stretch as it was, let's say, in Spain. Yes. Well, and that's um, it's part of my point in raising earlier that – so you can tell the story of the break of England from Rome in a lot of different ways. You know, Henry VIII is um, – He's tired of his first wife. He wants to marry a younger woman. This was, you know, and so he's looking for whatever justifi- justification he can find. And, you know, who cares if he breaks with the Church of England? He doesn't believe it anyway. And so he splits. Mm-hmm. Or um, that's probably the way that I was taught in high school. Sure. And that might, you know, it's this is the problem of history that uh, what's the quote? All history is fiction. Like the, the, whatever story we're telling, I'm not I'm not reading you quotes from Henry VIII mm-hmm. to say that. Um, but just to point out that of um uh, church and state are much more closely linked at this point. And so it's not just a neutral Pope has commented on a theological matter. It's an Italian has told an, Eng- uh, an, an, an English King that he can't further his line. Mm-hmm. And that's, so there's more to it than just on this theological matter. Henry the disagrees. It's he's being told you are going to plunge your sit, your uh, nation into um, ruin because I, a Pope told you to. Yeah even though I live so far from you yes. and it's, it's, it's a submission thing. Yes, right? exactly. And yeah, and that's There's precedent there. Yeah. And, and it's not just, and again, it's not just anyone. It's a Medici who's telling him this, like that's, it's just more complicated than Henry the eighth wants to divorce. Um, yes, I guess that's the only point I'm getting at. Hmm. I don't know if that, I think that lines up with what you're saying. I would just like to point out that right now in the world, um, the Euro cup is happening, the oh. European soccer game. And, and it's just, I don't know. I just love watching it. Um, with all of the, with just sort of the rich history of Europe always in the back of my mind. France just played Germany the other day. And I mean, how can you not watch France play Germany without like 800 years of history just like floating around on that pitch? Anyway, that's sort of my aside. Have you been watching any soccer, AJ? Nope. I've watched zero. I, yeah, good. Okay, so no uh, 
Uh, soccer is great is what I meant to say. Sorry. That was a great point. Oh, no. I, I got nothing against it. No. I didn't even know it was happening. Yeah. I'm, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Feeling disconnected. It's, uh, I, I wonder if the way that you go to that soccer game and not have 800 years of history flowing through your mind is just to soak yourself in alcohol. Yeah. A lot of people do that. I mean, I got to say that when yeah. Germany play Poland, ooh, some of the chants that go back and forth are not Risque, great. Oh, <laughs> yeah. gosh. Like Germany just marching into Poland, oh, <laughs> right? Like that kind nope, of stuff. Nope, not nope, great, nope, nope, but nope, nope. kind of great. <laughs> no, this is no good. Okay, so uh, Mary the First, we're at uh, Bloody Mary. I feel so, very awkward. Yeah. This, uh, this, this, I'm going <laughs> to move, saying, this is move why past this moment. This is, yeah. so as like, but, uh, move past this right. moment. Okay, so uh, Henry the Eighth. Yes. Look, I'm, I'm the one trying to not get us taken off of the internet. Okay, so uh, we've gone from Henry the Eighth to Edward the Sixth. Uh, which then takes us to Mary the First. So uh, Mary the First. So Mary the First is um, uh, Catholic, um, and that uh, that's what I was just reading about. Edward the Eighth, Edward the Sixth. Sorry, all these numbers was trying to not have Mary the First become queen. It doesn't work out, um, and um, Mary the First uh, essentially uh, uh, bans this English Reformation. She bans um, the Book of Common Prayer. She um, uh, puts to death many who were Protestant supporters. Uh, I think somewhere around 300, I think is the number. I don't have it right in front of me. Um, so a lot of people who end up dying. Um, just AJ brought this up earlier. Uh, Thomas Cranmer is one of those people who is ultimately put to death. It by who? Mary the first. Really? I thought he was killed by, uh, I think, oh man, if, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting all of this wrong and, and then finding it out later. Maybe Wolf Hall is about someone different. Um, so the way things work is that um, Mary the first takes, um, um, you know, takes the throne and uh, Kramer is put on uh, trial for treason, right? He was not a Catholic and um, she essentially is accusing him of what is clearly a true thing that he doesn't support the Catholic church. He has lots of chances. He, he gets to have discussions with many Catholic officials. Um, he ultimately he begins recanting his faith. He, he will um, say positive things about the Catholic church um, to, in, a, in, a, in an attempt to put himself under good graces um, with Mary the first. And it's starting to look like things are going to work out. The, um, the person he's meeting with um, accepts the reasons that Kramer gives the recantations he gives. He, uh, this, the, the guy accepts it essentially. Well, Mary the first doesn't accept it. And um, insists that, no mercy should be given to Kramer for his, you know, there are obviously more people involved than just Cranmer, but like he is kind of at that initial moment of the split with the Catholic church. And so Mary the first is not willing to He's the figure. I and mean, he ends up yes. being the, uh, the scapegoat or whatever. Yes, exactly. I was wrong. So Wolf Hall's about Cromwell, oh, um, okay. who is also a, an advisor who was Protestant to Henry the eighth, but Henry the eighth ends up killing him. Oh, um, Alistair Cromwell. Uh, no. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> That's where, I, it's too many Thomases, right? I know. That's, and then, like, uh, Granmer and Gromwell, and anyway, yeah. Uh, the, you, you asked me why I don't do episodes on, like, this very history, because <laughs> this is why, because I don't know it. Um, That's why, again, like, the questions around, like, how did Edward the Sixth die? It's like, I don't know. It's, yeah. He just died. But oh, anyway, what, what, what so we'll fall about Cromwell, who is also involved in this whole yeah, story, but too. back with Henry yeah. VIII. And, That's where, anyway. and I'm, uh, I'm over-focused on this one strain to get us to the Book yes. of Common Prayer. Um, so uh, the uh, AJ already made reference to this. Uh, Kramer is attempting to recant his Protestant belief, or, you know, English reformed beliefs and Mary the first doesn't accept it. So Mary, he is put to death ultimately is what is happening. He's given the chance for one more. Uh, he's able to recant one more time before he is ultimately put to death. And he knows that he's about to be put to death. And so he submits his uh, comments to, uh, you know, everyone so that they can approve it. He then uh, gets up to give this final recantation. And as he gets up to give it, instead of reading from his notes, he um, he promises that when he goes to be burned as a heretic, that his hand, his, you know, his writing hand, his right hand will go into the flame first um, because it's the one um, – um, that, that he had lied with so much. So the first to be punished, the first to be purified, um, is that hand, um, um, as he goes into the flame, that's what he promises to all of them. So he undoes his recantation in his final moment. Right. So, uh, uh confirms himself as a, again, I, I keep wanting to say Protestant, but I, like English Protestant, I don't know if that 
anyway. So he promises that his hand will be the first to go in. He also uh, calls the Pope the Antichrist. He condemns the Catholic Church for false doctrine. And then he's pulled from the place where he's giving this talk, taken to the fire. He, he does what he says he will. He puts his hand into the flame to be burned first. And then he's totally pushed into the flame. And then his final words are, um, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I see the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So, and that is Kramer. I mean, that's pretty epic It is as a way to go. Was there a part that I missed? Is that? No, I mean, okay. that's, that's, you had more knowledge of it than I did. Yeah. I just remembered the, the hand, the writing hand into the fire first because that's what he had recanted with. Yes. That's such a cool story. Um, I was trying to, f- yeah. I'm worried that my last words are going to be something like, Oh no. Cause I'll get hit <laughs> by a car or something yeah. like, you know, I mean, the, at least, at least he had the moment to sort of plan those words out. I yeah. wonder how many last words have been totally undignified. Like nurse, Probably most of them. Nurse, right? yeah. <laughs> nurse, nurse, or like, yeah, 2% is fine or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> Because you're allergic to milk? Is that the... Well, just like you got, you got milk at a coffee place, you got coffee, and oh, then man. you got hit. No. This is horrible. On your way home. Like, you know. It's no good. Yeah. How many were good night? Mm. Yeah, Probably really most of them. Man, jeez. That well, that's a, that's bad, a pretty bleak thing to think about. Sorry no. about taking us down this little road. No, that's why you say, like, I love you every time you see someone. Like, your your oh. people mm-hmm. that you care for is... Because you never know when that'll be the last time you see them. I love you guys. Oh, this is getting, oh. Oh, this is getting dark. Um, okay, so that gets us through the story of uh, Kramer... Um, you know, there are, there are eventually more changes made to the book of common prayer. Again, there's the language is changing. The spelling is changing. Some of the, you know, the early book of common prayer isn't, um, the ones I've seen are pretty small. And so clearly things are being added to it over time. Um, you know, and by the time we get the version that the Anglican church of North America puts out, it's in addition to all of the services and prayers that you have. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now, does that book have within it all of the serve like does that book have is it like a handbook for um like if if you are doing a installation of a new bishop is it, is yep. that service in there yep okay so it's it's so clearly it's probably grown because of like how do you if you have like a i don't know foreign dignitary uh, attending a church service how, yep. what do you do that and, kind of yeah stuff? and just to finish the sentence from before it's also ad- adding more documents to mm-hmm. the um the book so like there are founding documents to the anglican church such as the 39 articles um, so these are kind of things that are distinctives from the Catholic Church that the Church of England proclaims that's included in there. You'll get prefaces from old books of common prayer. So that's another part of what you're saying, Graham, of like, there's just more history to put into the book as history continues, right? As time goes on. Um, but yeah, yeah so that's memorial what... Memorial services and for yes. wars and that kind of thing. Yes. And even, you know, I guess we'll go into it. There's like a, a section for occasional prayers. Well, some of those occasional prayers have to do with the United States and Canada, like, or they'll have like different... Um, and different holidays, you know, that are, that are modern holidays. So things like that, they're adapting and changing over time. I liked your rock on sign for Canada, as I said that. So good. Okay. So, uh, just to say again, there are changes that are made to the book of common prayer post 1559, that version. So you get like three versions in 10 years, then you'll kind of have a slowdown until I think 1662 is the next major one. And it's essentially that 1662 one with different, um, like minor modernizations, but then you'll get in the current American, in the Episcopalian church currently, I think the 1979 is the current one. Um, and has been for a while. Well, uh, since 1979, that's how math works. Um, the, the, you know, I I won't go into any of this, but the, in, in North America, the Episcopalian church has split from the Anglican church of North America and the Anglican church of North America put out a new book of common prayer in 2019. So that's part of what's prompting all this also. Just all that to say, if you look for a book of common prayer, if you get either 1979 or 2019, you'll have a very good resource in front of you. So don't, it's one of those, you don't need to worry too much about which one of those two that you get. Um, I have both. I used the 79 one for a few years before now I have the 2019 one. So if the book of common prayer is a thing you're interested in, you don't need to like worry too much about which one you're getting. Okay. So that was like 45 minutes of preface to the like actual thing that AJ asked for in the first place. So hope you appreciate that. That's how this is because I'm rambling. I do. It was super interesting. Oh, that's kind of you to say. No, I, I love when you guys talk about history, especially English history. Like, man, that stuff's crazy. It's yeah. Uh, yes. Um, except we don't. Except don't we don't know. know it. It. That's the thing. I, uh, we're going to get a very Cromwell and Grammar all the well, time. I mean, it, for me, it just imparts a feel of mystery. Oh, excellent. <laughs> 
that's a long kind <laughs> so, of mystery. Yeah. So I know that some people died. I don't know who, wit, who or when yeah. or how they died, but I just know it was a bloody time. Yeah, like, I, I enjoy that. Yeah. So I'm okay with it. That's about how much I know. So good. Uh, okay. So that, so, you know, I'm going to, now I'll do the fun thing where I skip over 400 years of history. So don't worry about anything between 1559 and 2019. Done. No. I never do. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, nothing <laughs> ever happened. so again, the, the original question AJ asked and that I've dodged for 45 minutes is how do you use this book of common prayer? Um, so just, I'll, I'll briefly talk about what's in it cause we're, you know, wrapping up toward the end of our time. So first off, just to say again, I'm referencing a 2019 book. You could get a 1979. They're both great. Um, what is in this book? Graham was just getting at this. So, like the main thing in this book is it's how to run a church service. Like that's your, that's your main thing that's in there. So um, the prayers that you'll, I mean, the entire service from like um, it opens to it ends is in the book of common prayer. Now you'll see some um, deviations from that. When you go to individual churches, this kind of was your point before about Catholicism, Graham, that, you know, certain songs are preferred by certain congregations. They'll get, put in certain places, but just to say the, the entire church service is in here. Some Anglican churches have a little lady with an organ. Some Anglican churches have like the priest pick up a guitar and his vestments. <laughs> it just sort of depends which one you're going to. You um, I you, would just about kill to go to a church with a, with a decent organ. I love organs. You don't want a priest with playing it like an acoustic yeah, guitar and his vestments? Those two? Yeah, seriously. Singing shine, Jesus shine. I mean, that's pretty awesome. If you could be accompanied by an old lady <laughs> on an organ. <laughs> Why not? That's, both? that's the best of both worlds. Yeah, it's true. Have you been to that church before? I went to, I've been to both of those churches many times. So Where was the organ church? Can, <laughs> I, can I go there? Yeah, it's, 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 oh. St. Paul's on Bloor in Toronto. Oh, you got to go yeah, to Toronto. In Toronto. Yeah, that's okay, my problem. Sorry. So again, part of this is so part of the Book of Common Prayer. If you're not a priest or if you're not like leading services, there are large chunks of this that you won't use regularly. Though, if you ever have a question about, you know, I really liked that prayer we said on Sunday. What is it that the book of common prayer would tell you that in most cases. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, when I say the church service is in there, you're probably thinking, you know, and what are the other 800 pages, right? Cause that would take up like five pages. Well, there are all different versions of services you could go to. So Holy week, the week leading up to Easter has a different type of service than a service with a baptism, which is also a section in here. So a lot of what's in here is our services that you don't, you should not be like reading though. You can do whatever you want to with your life, but you probably shouldn't be reading that every day. Those aren't the parts to be referencing regularly. Um, a, the section of it that's more for like, like lay people for like regular people like you and me is this thing called the daily office. And the daily office is just a goofy name for a regular set of prayer throughout the day. Um, it's modeled uh, in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. There are there's morning, midday, evening, and Compline. So there are four kind of kind of three of those prayers. That's modeled at, off of the Old Testament. Um, there was a morning prayer, afternoon, and evening prayer. Which here's my bad Hebrew for the day. Uh, Shah, I'm not even going to do it. Never mind. There, in the Old Testament, there are three times of prayer, and the Anglican model is is modeled off of that. If you're in certain um, Catholic churches, you may have heard of the daily office as a set of seven prayers. Or if you go to a um, a monastery or uh, a convent, you might see them doing seven prayers. You're not getting up in the middle of the night, Thomas. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Two of the, you know, one of them is at like four in the morning. Um, so uh, if, is that, that's Matins, I think is the first one. Matins, there's Vespers, is like, mid, is Vespers midnight? Uh, or is Vespers I think Compline. For, isn't Compline? Compline's midnight, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it was, yeah. Anyway. Vespers the one right before bed. I think Compline mm-hmm. is, like, is the midnight and then um, Matins is 4 a.m., somewhere around there. But that, that's, Graham is joking about this, but like that's one of the reasons there are only three of these is that it's four everyday people in English like, are sleepy people. <laughs> sleepy exactly, people. Yes. And like a, a regular person is not going to wake up, you know, once at midnight and then another time at 4am. It's meant for people to actually use. So, um, dang shots fired at the, <laughs> what? Oh, it's just, I mean, they're at I'm, monks and well, I don't oh, know. At, at holy people surely there people are some seven. people or maybe there's people like during Easter or something that will do in the seven. Is the seven in there? No. Okay. They don't have it. They don't have it. No. Gotcha. Um, and I want to say that's from, I think that's from the beginning of the Book of Common Prayer. There's been a reduced number of them. Um, so, yes, I'm sure there are some, there are people that maintain those hours and, and bless them for doing it. But this is meant to be uh, like this. The Anyone could do this, right? You can wake up in the morning, have a morning prayer with your family, 
take a break during lunch, do a midday prayer, and then pray at night with your family, right? Like th- mm-hmm. those are things that anyone could do. And that's more what the daily office is going for. So just to say it again, the daily office is the thing to be referencing regularly. Um, in the 2019 version, it's like the first thing when you open up the Book of Common Prayer is the daily office. Um, I would advise anyone who wants to start having a like regular time of prayer not to do the full office because the morning one takes about an hour. The midday one's pretty short. It's maybe 15 or 20 minutes, but the, and then the evening one's also about an hour. Like they're just, they're very long. Um, so either, um, find a few prayers that you like from it. Um, anyway, just don't, it's, it's that thing about like developing a new habit. You shouldn't just jump in 100% with something. You should kind of ease yourself into it. So please don't try and do all three prayers in one day. You'll be unhappy. Okay. Do you all have any kind of, just now that I'm thinking about it, do you have any kind of prayer practice like that? A morning, afternoon, evening thing? No, I'm trying to reestablish because yeah. you know me, lover of freedom. When I was when I was a kid, I was like, you know what? We should be praying all the time. So why should I, why should I like adhere to the tradition of it? And now that I grow older, I see the value of the tradition. It's so that, you know, life doesn't get in the way and that, you know, to hedge up against those little bits of the nature of man that are going to come in and and ruin stuff like just the habit of not praying. Sure. And so I I want to reestablish something and I actually might look at the book of prayer as a way to do it. That would be really helpful to me. Yeah. That's part of, you know, just, um, you know, my kid just turned two. So just being a dad over these last two years, there's something very helpful in not having to, recreate all this mm-hmm. like not and and there, uh, there's something you know there's something good to having um a unique prayer practice for your family but it's right. also nice not having to do all of this on your own and being able to pray alongside others with the same book of common prayer so that's been very helpful of having a resource that's like just pray this right like these are these are things that have been passed down for 500 years much of it is scripture which means it's older than that um so that's, that's something I've definitely appreciated. Mm-hmm. I don't have to find like the most beautiful prayer to pray because a typical evening prayer is collected here. It's super nice. Yeah. Right. I know that my, the, the folks I rent a room from do Bible time with their kids every night and having, having a piece of the common book of prayer would book a common prayer would be really nice in that. Yeah. I think. Um, okay. So that, that's that first part right there is the daily office. The daily office will make reference to other sections in the book of common prayer. So you just have to flip between them. That's why if you're on, if you're on YouTube, you'll see this, but if you're just listening, you won't, they, they sell different versions of the, of the book. And of, you know, obviously as a super Anglican, I have both of them. There's like a, the regular version, which is like the cloth cover that you would see at church. And then they also have like a nice little leather bound one that has little ribbons in it. You could also buy like a $2 little ribbon bookmark. And, but anyway, it's, it's helpful to have those ribbons to, uh, flip throughout the book because you'll be as you're doing the daily office you'll have to flip to the psalms you'll have to flip to the collects you'll have to flip throughout the book okay sorry that was a tangent okay so daily office is the main thing that would is helpful that is like a daily thing to reference and to look at um, after that it's a bunch of different services that you don't really need to be referencing regularly um, you know in a book the whole thing is about 800 pages 200 of those pages are um, translations of the psalms Um, So part of that is referenced during the daily office. It's also what's used on Sundays for Anglicans, um, but it's not, um, they are, I don't know the best way to say it. They're, they're like, uh, they're translations of the Psalms that are meant to be said out loud. So there's like a, there's like a poetic quality to them. And I'm sure someone who knows more about the translations can say more about it, but But they sometimes break them into a call and response, right? Yes. That's a, and you'll see them structured that way too. And part of that is, you know, all like the, the form of, psalm is to have a line and then an indented line right um in which sets it up as a call and response um but i don't know the way to like um yeah i don't don't, maybe we'll talk about it in the in between but like the message started out as a translation of the psalms but was an attempt to make it a more down to earth i guess translation of message yeah that's what that's how it started the message literally says in it to raise the roof yeah, in that, like a collo- like like God raises the roof. Yes, and that's what I was going to say. Of um, I'm sure it was fun at the time, but <laughs> but now so did we have a student whose grandpa was one of the co-authors of the message? I don't know, maybe I, don't I think know. so. Um, but just to say that in in reading a more an attempt to modernize and make it you know relevant, um, you know I personally don't find that appealing. Some might, um, but these are an attempt at a more poetic 
um, version of the Psalms, which is, I think, what um, draws people to something like the King James Bible, right? It sounds more literary than your colloquial way of talking. So just to say that, that's more what the 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 Anglican translations are going for, just to say that. Uh, then there are more services in there, um, and then it gets to a section. Um, um, uh, it's collects and occasional prayers. Uh, the, the way I, I've always heard this, and I'm sure this means it's wrong, is that it's called a collect because they're collected prayers. I don't know if anyone oh, I thought it was a collect because it was supposed to, it was you did at the beginning of the service to bring people together. <laughs> like you ever, it was the literally people. the thing that collected the people. There you go. To worship, but I I, I may have just See, made we that just up. Make all the stuff as we go. It was like a seven year old. That's well, what I made I up in to, my I, head. I, I You're want, still going to have one or two foyer stragglers <laughs> that are going to want to talk and talk about their week yeah. and don't want to come in. But. I do. I want us to be cited as a like, uh, you know, collect comes from this, and then we're the citation, and then we've clearly made it up. Yeah, that, yeah. That's how long my word made it is when yeah, we well. make it there. Um, but these it'll co- come up in review for our uh, podcasting <laughs> license. You know, we're coming up on that. Yeah, four years or whatever it is. I don't know how many the fees on that are ridiculous. Oh my word! Wait, hold on. Um, but just to say that uh, the, the collects are the prayers to say throughout the week. Again, this is to, uh, you know, you don't have to be original. You don't have to come up with these prayers on your own. They are collected here. And what's helpful is that it will it, it will point you toward praying through certain topics you wouldn't pray for normally. For me, that would be like praying for um, missionaries abroad. It's just not something I think about a lot. Well, that'll be brought into these collects um, to ensure that you are praying for more than just, you know, God, give me success, right? Or something like that. You just say pray that we have fun. Yes, I know. I know that's your pet just peeve. Just pray that, like, the test goes well and we have fun. Um, that goes... Ah, the prayers of teenagers. <laughs> it's, it's, it is wonderful. I still see no, nothing wrong for praying for fun. <laughs> Could you... Anyway. Um, after... Again, these are conversations that are in between. Um, after that is um, occasional prayers. <coughs> Sorry, listeners. Um, so the occasional prayers are for if you have a certain thing on your mind and you're looking for words to pray for, um, this gives you um, some words to say. Um, so uh, you'll have, if you want to pray for the care of children, if you want to pray for a birthday, if you want to pray for guidance, if you want to pray for mercy, um, uh, a litany of Thanksgiving, uh, um, you just have all kinds of different options of things to pray in there. And again, you kind of get this, it's a more poetic prayer than one I would come up with on my own. But you don't reference the occasional prayers as often. Again, daily office is your main thing, but occasional prayers are good too. We're almost at the end, sorry. And uh, this wraps up, there's the um, calendar of the Christian year. So if you have questions about feast days, or I think you even get like the lectionary readings in here, um, it's all printed here. So there's no like question of what should I be reading? Because it's all printed at the back. Is there a feast day today? I'm sorry? Is there a feast day today? I guess I could look it up right now. Hold on. What is say today is the sixteenth. Yeah, man, why gotta get me looking this up right Sorry. now? Sorry, no, you're good. What do you think? What feast day do you think it is, Tom, AJ? Feast of what? Hedgehogs. <laughs> yeah, how did you why? Know? Why in June? There's nothing. No feast day. No feast day. No. June sixteenth. There's nothing. This will come out on the. Oh no, it'll come out either today or tomorrow, and there's no feast day for either one. Very. When's sorry. the next feast day? Eighteenth. So right after that. Uh, Catechist and Martyr in Rhodesia, Bernard Mazecki. Dang. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's actually, uh, oh, anyway. Yeah, well, anyway, there's so much in here. But just to say, if like, we've talked about, like, the, um, church calendar and stuff. Well, that stuff's printed here. You don't have to, like, guess what season we're in or anything like that. And then at the very back of the Book of Common Prayer, there's some, like, historical documents, which you can look through if you're curious. But, you know, it's there as a reference material more than anything. Okay, so what's the point? There are parts of the Book of Common Prayer that are for regular use. The daily office would be the main thing for that in your uh, prayer day to day. And then if you have questions about any service that you go to, it's included in here. And then if you're just looking for a a great translation of the Psalms, that takes up about a quarter of the Book of Common Prayer in total. So I would highly recommend that. But that's the, you know, there's a, it's kind of a, it's a complicated history of why the Church of England split in the first place and then why this Book of Common Prayer exists now but as a historical document i find it very personally helpful it's what my family uh prays together every night we do uh, a shortened version of compline together and um, i'm just very thankful for it in my life and so i wanted to share that with our listeners i think that's all i got cool that's awesome i have questions for the in-between episode Good. well great all right so this has been classical stuff you should know you can support us on patreon if you'd like 
It's what's what's the address on that? Patreon.com slash classical stuff. You got it. Uh, we have website, classicalstuff.net. You can tweet at us at C L S S C A L stuff. You can email us at the guys at classical stuff.com. We'll try to get back to you. Dot in, net. Dot net. We'll try to get back to you if we can. Uh, we get lots of emails and sometimes we have pretty busy lives, so it's it's hard to get to all of those. If you have sent us something and haven't heard back, well, we've still probably got it, you know, floating around somewhere and we'll get to it if we if we possibly can. Thanks for listening and we will see you next week. Bye. Ciao.